Hello and welcome to the Mellow episode of the Nausicast. Mellow because, well, you'll see. The Nausicast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and discuss our analysis and our research findings. This time not so many research findings and hopefully at least a little of analysis. <laughs> um, today we're not... Uh, Today, for the first time, we're not going to talk about a movie directed by Miyazaki and not about a movie directed by Takahata, but by someone else. It's a 1993 TV film called Ocean Waves and it's directed by Tomomi Mochizuki. Interesting uh, person, I looked at his record and, well, really nothing else really of note He apparently directed the 90s remake of uh, or re-release of Dirty Pair called Dirty Pair Flesh, uh, a couple of Maison Ikoku episodes, Yokohama Shopping Lock Quiet Country Cafe, so the inferior second OVA, and a horrible little thing called Poopa. And I don't know, any band guys in chat? Hey. We watched it on a bad anime night once with a couple of people, and Poopa is really not a good feat. So it's a director with a very uh, <laughs> roller coaster like record, I would say. After all, having worked on a Studio Ghibli film right before Poopa is quite remarkable. So, um, if as always, if you don't want to watch the video version on YouTube, we always provide a download link in the description, and I'm going to introduce you to our to my lovely co-hosts now all returning names so here we have hipster kusulu back at it again boys we have tasu hello and we have the thunderer hi <laughs> deep sighs <laughs> deep sighs <laughs> all right Let's get right into some of the production details, at least as many as I was able to unearth. If you have anything uh, to add to this after your research findings, please tell me. But Ocean Waves, also name, uh, also known as I Can Hear the Sea, uh, interestingly enough, is a um, interesting production. It's based on a novel from 1990 from a very famous shoujo novelist named Saiko Himuro. And it was an attempt by Studio Ghibli to give their younger staff a project to work on. So the idea behind it was to really get all the younger people, I think like up to 35, 40 uh, in age, and to have them quickly, cheaply deliver a quality Ghibli product. Uh, it ended up going over budget and over schedule. So <laughs> that's how that went. It was a co-production with JC Staff, Madhouse, and O Productions, and um, had obviously many of the Ghibli staff who worked on previous Ghibli projects. Um, yes, uh, the director Mochizuki was at the time 34 years old. That's quite young for uh, directing a Ghibli film, I would say. I don't think that's precedented afterwards anymore. <laughs> Or was it, how old was Goro uh, Miyazaki when he was uh, directing Ursi? I don't know. I'm pretty sure he's in like his 40s at that point though. Yeah, I'm also pretty sure. So, yeah, the ethos behind this project was produced quickly, cheaply and with quality. Um, and I don't know, did you think they managed to achieve that? <laughs> I think I the, uh, like if we're talking production wise, yeah, it's, it's definitely quite quality, like really great background art for a lot of it. Uh, like nothing is ever like off model. Everything looks really nice and clean. It's uh, very like simplified kind of following the Ghibli ethos of design. But I, I think it's missing a lot of the, um, yeah, there's like no the, flares exp to it. That's exp true. Expressive character animation of a lot of other Ghibli yeah. movies, and that's like something yeah. I, that definitely definitely suffers because it's going for like kind of exaggerated realism, but a, a la like um, only yesterday. But like it, when you try to go for that, but then lack the like ability to express that um, um, realism through the characters feeling human, you, you kind of lack something. Yeah, I did notice that um, with, with Ocean Waves, it's probably like Ghibli's. Um, only if not like maybe just first because i've not seen poppy hill but like it's trying to be uh like a incredibly like real realistic film even in like the way it's presented because takahara can't ha help himself from having like neat little bits of like uh anime original stuff in his work so it's like uh in only yesterday we see um the kids running about in between 
like the memories and uh, real life, like where she is in the present. And we get all those little dream sequences she had. And uh, the same in Fireflies, we see like the ghosts. But this is like a like very down to earth. There's not not any point in which like the reality of the film breaks and like the animation becomes like fantastical. Yeah, I'm thinking right now, but I think Up From Poppy Hill is probably the only real example if we are counting Whisper of the Heart's uh, uh, fiction Yeah, or well, even Whisper right? of the Heart, yeah, that has yeah. all those fantastic scenes with mm. the, the Baron as well. So we are extremely grounded, which leads me to an interesting question. Uh, only yesterday was brought up, and I can see quite a few similarities simply because it's both grounded in realism, but also mainly told through flashbacks and memories true recollections and we have like a framing narrative where we have a current day person thinking back to these events that shaped them so what we discussed when only yesterday uh, in the only yesterday cast is how important the fact that it was animated is to the movie how much flourishes and how many visual effects were um, added to make the memory scenes more memory-like, more hazy, but also more fantastical, more emotionally driven. And I kind of feel like Ocean Waves misses that mark completely. Like, it's going for something else, but also at this point, I'm very confused about the explicit choice to make it animation because all other Studio Ghibli films have clear things in them where we understand why it has been done in animation specifically. Okay, I think that's a couple of reasons. The first is, like, you see throughout most of the movie, it's not as, like, clearly pronounced as you see it in, um, in Only Yesterday, but there is a, a kind of, like, white area, whitish area that often, like, exists at the edge of the frame. And that, like, almost looks like, you know, like, 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 similar to, like, the flashback scenes in Only Yesterday, where you, 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 you're, you're in this, like, space of knowing it's, um, it's, it's the past. I mean, it's the same kind of thing, like, you know, sepia toting, like, past scenes and, like, live action movies and stuff, but it definitely is using the drawn perspective to do that and and to, to um, convey this memory like nature of it also i think it helps convey a vagueness to it that it's um i don't know like i think that is done pretty it's, it's pretty essential for that part to be an animation the other thing is that there's so many of the backgrounds are so how do we express this they're they're very um they they don't look like real backgrounds. I mean, they they look really luscious and like well drawn stuff, and they definitely like have a realism to them. But they have this. They, again, they 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 express this kind of vagueness that you wouldn't get actually showing proper backgrounds with the live action footage. So, I think I I think a lot of that 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 I think that that's the central reason why it's animated is for that sort of vagueness you wouldn't get just pointing a camera or something. Yeah. Also, like the old Takahata adage of the uh, 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 animation through abstraction reminds us about the things we've forgotten about the real thing or something along the lines that a uh, quote I loved doing only yesterday. Yeah, I think, I think it still applies here. So is this film trying to mimic and copy Takahata's directing style? Um, again, because the, the guy who, who, who directed this wasn't really like within Ghibli, like he was off directing other stuff before he joined for this, I believe. I mean, he might have been around, but... Uh, I don't know how influenced he was directly, but it definitely see, it seems like a lot of the production would have carried on with a lot of the people who would have worked on only yesterday and other Takahata work. Because like we say, even like the the way the backgrounds are painted, I, I should have looked up who the background artist was because I could. It seems like very similar to a lot of the ones he would use, as particularly Pompoko. I feel like the coloring and the choice of like all this modern Japanese architecture really reminds me. So I feel like I actually recall looking at the stuff and seeing that the ocean waves background painter was the same one that did only yesterday but i'm not sure anymore kind of um i could be wrong let me look it up meanwhile oh yeah um i'll start my uh, an idea i had see if anyone else noticed this but uh particularly about the backgrounds and it's how they're reused is it's a movie about like uh the impression of adulthood like that's a huge theme throughout the movie of like uh, kids trying to be adults and adults maybe acting like kids sometimes and they're kind of mixture they're yeah. at their last years of high school and it's that real like blend of like struggling to be an adult but still being treated like a child and I felt like there was a very pronounced um, theme throughout the whole movie of like oppressive architecture like so many of the buildings are like huge and like towering above all the kids like there's so many shots where it's like it's looming down on them or they're like looking up at like the the uh, castle or the school that has like this big clock tower, 
And even like the, the way the corridors are, they seem almost exaggerated. Like they're these huge, wide, open corridors that like hang above their heads. And it's almost like this impression of the adult world that's like uh, bearing down upon them at all times. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I think did there are not a couple. Pick up on that at all? Yeah, I, I picked up the two hipster. I think there are, there are a couple of things to unpack there. The first thing is the um, the attempt to be adults because it's interesting how the very first like staked conflict of the movie is their the main character and his friends upsetness over their school trip being canceled. Um, it, 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 what's interesting about that is not necessarily like, okay, so they, it, it's, it seems to be kind of a relatively frivolous thing. I mean, they're just going to Kyoto. It's not even like a, like a long trip. And like, and, but, but the reason he gets upset seems to be tied to the fact that, A, he, he's, he's, he wrote in his little essay, oh, I'm not, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, when they asked him, Braden essay, why you're upset about this, um, he's like, I'm, I, I, they shouldn't be able to do this. Like the adults shouldn't just be able to take away our rights or like promise us something and take it away. It's like his upsetness over this like kind of like frivolous and like powerless nature he has in the face of these powers. But the second reason he's upset is he expresses this later is um when he goes home to his parents and he's like very upset at his mom. Even his mom doesn't seem to understand why because th- the um teachers say that oh the parents agree that we should we should we should we should take away this field trip for the goal of making their their grades better because we spend more time on their grades and he like has this like he go he, he like he's it's not expressed like directly but he definitely like has this simmering discontent with his par- with his mother for that mm. um and this is related i think pretty clearly to the relationship in the movie and and her, and her father and mother and how her discontent with those those authority figures so i, I I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with this, but I think so, I think that the uh, attempts to be adults come this wanting to be adults also comes with this baggage of kind of a discontent and like anger with their parents for not doing them right. Hmm. So interesting thing about those uh, grades too that you mentioned. So uh, tr- canceling the trip improves grades. Grades is kind of always a little bit juxtaposed uh, in this film, also in a different situation by. Rikako, who is completely socially isolated by her class, but apparently her grades keep improving even in the meantime. And I wonder if this feeds in any way into the into the story moving on into college age, where obviously the grades and the entrance exams matter quite a bit more than the frivolities of youth. I don't know if it goes in that direction per se, but what I yeah, what I really feel is what you were saying, Thundy, where it's like this discontent with the parents, because yeah, it's really about the movies are like really trying to nail this exact like time of these people's lives where it's like there are kids who are in their last year of high school and they're like basically adults. Like he's working a job, he's doing everything that like or he's kind of like performing working a job. I'll go back to that because I have notes on that as well. Mm. But um they're very close to being adults. They're almost in college and they're almost at like drinking age. They can drive like we even cut uh, like a year later and they're all doing that stuff. So they're basically adults, but they're still like under the thumb of, of the, the real adults and they're not being treated. And it's about that friction that like all teenagers feel at that age and like really trying to capture the the feeling of that and the, uh, the kind of like the impotence of it and like the rage that I feel like manifests mostly in Taku, and that's like his kind of main conflict. Yeah, and I mean, also Rika, Rikako, who due to her parents divorcing, got tr- yeeted out of Tokyo where she wanted to be uh, more instead of in Kochi. Kochi? Uh, I think it's Kochi. Kochi, yeah. Kochi, Kochi. Yeah. Kochi. Kochi. Um, she is impotent against her parents also when she tries to uh, basically not elope, but, you know, get away, get back to Tokyo. It's all against her mother, um, but ma- and this is why I brought up the grades, by the way, to tie into what Sandy said about the, p- the parents as well, right? Because the grades are obviously what the mother wants. It's it's tied into this idea. She's being like the perfect daughter at school, but then she has like this this breakout moment where she goes to Tokyo. So that's why I felt there was this dynamic imprinted into this dynamic of the grades, which also is what our main um, 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 main uh, our main Morisaki uh, Taku Morisaki comments on when he was angry at his mother and is fighting for preserving the school club, uh, the school trip. Also, I think it's pretty interesting. It's just a, uh, a little parallel, not, not necessarily like a main theme, but like a little like Oedipus Electra theme throughout the movies that we only ever see uh, Taku uh, interact with his mother. Like the father is there, but he's basically like a statue just reading the newspaper and uh, he, he has friction with his mother. And then we only ever see uh, Rikaku uh, talk to her father 
So like seeing those parallels and like that friction created between the uh, the uh, opposite sex like parent figure, and then we kind of like understand their relationship to each other a bit through that. I think about the the scene where he writes his discontent with the reasoning as to why they can't go on go on the trip. Uh, he like my subtitles said that uh, it just doesn't like he wrote it just doesn't make sense, and that seemed to be more of like an attack on the adult's immaturity to actually like explain themselves. Like the adults never seem to like want to explain themselves to the children and uh, like just the teachers are very immature in this, in how they like uh, f- throw away the, the kids' arguments. And, yeah, the, the teacher's like, real dick about it too. He's on stage like, anyone who really wants to disagree yeah. with me, raise your hand. Okay, you yeah. go to the extra room. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah that, that scene was actually great because, uh, I mean, not that scene in the hall, the, the scene back in the office where they're originally complaining because that's another great example of like um, the adults acting a bit like children or like they're complaining mm-hmm. to the teacher and then he, he really has nothing to come back at them with. So he just goes, oh, you're just um, going at her because she's a woman. Like stand up yeah. for yourself or something. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. what, a, what a coward. Like you're just talking down to like a teenager and he can't even like find any words to argue with him. Yeah. So I, I think it's another that, like hint at like how adults are, are quite immature in their own way. Mm-hmm. I think that's quite a good contrast to like also uh, we see later Rikiko's dad is uh, acting very much as a, in his own pleasures and maybe selfishly, you can say, like from our, our perspective at least. Uh, we just kind of like see him with uh, this new significant other where he like he painted over Rikiko's room and she's really mad because essentially. Uh, like he's transformed Rikiko's old home into something where her family doesn't belong anymore. I think this is also like part of it. I, I don't know, maybe I'm stretching, but like the father obviously moved on from a marriage that didn't make him happy and painted over the room because his daughter was not with him anymore. And he wasn't probably due mm-hmm. to the rough divorce, not really expecting to see her anytime soon. Um, so it's in a sense he moved on, but the daughter obviously wanted to remain like a special person to her father and mm-hmm. was very fucking distraught about uh, this situation meanwhile it's just the i guess mature thing to do like people move on people paint over the old wallpaper right yeah there's, there's a certain yeah. i think also there's, there's a certain um, sexual dimension to that scene um because um as, as we know together like we like the characters relate relate to their 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 opposite sex um parent um and she definitely is going back to her father with this like kind of idea that she'll be taking it open hands and like her room has been rep- her room has been painted over and basically in her space in the home replaced by a almost certainly um mistress or maybe future uh, uh, wife it's not made clear um but like when when her space in the house is like basically been replaced and sexualized she's like a lose her innocence and b she like loses her idea that she has you know a sexual connection to her father which is why i think she goes afterwards to stay with our our main character i, I forget all their names um in his hotel room and she's and um Tucker. where yeah, where she goes and sleeps in his bed. So I don't know. I, th- I think there's, a, there's an interesting sexual dimension to this rejection. Um, and, I, and I think it's a good segue to talk about the extreme Freudian imagery in this movie. Um, cause I think it's like literally everywhere. Um, as, as, as Hipster mentioned earlier, like the long hallways are definitely like in, like a, like a vaginal, um, perspective. You see it a lot of the times the hallways are perspective when he's thinking about her, people are talking about, um, What's her name? Sorry, I'm so with, with the, the girl. Um, and Rikaku. Yeah, Rikaku. And basically, a lot, a lot, especially when they're talking about her aloofness, like you're always showing long hallways. And whenever um, the main character is trying to think about her as a object, or like whenever he's trying to like present himself to the world in this kind of in in these ways, like these um when he's being put, talked down to as in the school, or when he's trying to like find his place in the world, you see these like these the castle or the bell tower, these like phallic symbols and. Like it's definitely trying. It's it, the movie's definitely, I think, attempting to um, construct these these characters as kind of like mythological um, masculine, feminine figures in this way. Yeah. Uh, added note on that in uh, the the original scene where we're introduced to her, uh, th- like where the friend calls him up and he goes and they're looking down on her through the uh, the classroom into the teacher's like office. 
I thought that might be actually like the best like piece of like genius directing in the whole film where not only are we getting this like lens of her of like they're viewing her down through these like multiple frames but we never like see her face we're only like like the friend just tells the Mm -hmm. character and us the audience that she is this like really gorgeous girl so gorgeous that he like pulled him out of his job to cycle across town just to get a glimpse at her and like and it's also genius because like they're all like the faces are all you know kind of ghibli same face you know uh (laughs) like I i don't agree with that as a criticism but you know they are all drawn like somewhat plainly but because we get that instant image in our head about her and who she's supposed to be, when we see her like fall for the first time, you can like really like understand what the characters are seeing in her, even if it's a pretty plain face. Yeah, we are presented her uh, with her as an object. She enters the frame as an object, and she remains an object for almost the entirety of the movie. Yeah. And, and that's also interesting because the first time she meets the main, she, she, she has very little interaction with the main character throughout the entire movie. Like, I mean, like, it's, it's almost played clearly that she, like, almost never talks to him. They aren't really friends. Um, but when she comes to encounter him the first time when they're in Hawaii and she asks for, for a loan from him, uh, more on that later. That's, I think it's a really important scene. Um, she talks about, oh, how, um, his friend, and also forget the name of the glasses guy, um, Matsuno. Matsuno, um, told her all about him so like her her impressions of him are also a, a bunch of imp- like m- constructed memories that she has taken from um fr- fr- from 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 the glasses guy where his Matsuno. his uh, Matsuno <laughs> and his impression of her is about uh is, is is constructed from Matsuno's um expressions about her so both of their but both of their understandings of each other are entirely Indirect. They're they're, mm. they're 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 about they're about the impression they have each other about like these this kind of like set of ideas which are I think like th- which they I think have extrapolated extrapolated on and created like a kind of as I said earlier like a mythologized idea of each other as like a masculine and feminine figure that are that are kind of at odds and like separate from each other. Yeah, I think that's true. We we definitely get that building of like you, like you're saying those like mythological archetypes throughout um, a lot of the early film, particularly for her, because like we say, she's she's introduced as an object, and then she's introduced like like to the entire school where like she's doing like really great at her grades. She's like beating the the tennis coach at uh, like just on the first day. She's beating the captain of the tennis team like easily and like all the boys are like in the locker room like oh did you see those legs lads you know like uh we we were like fed this entire image of her before we have any like any real interactions at all with her yeah also gossip gossip is a huge one like the mom has heard about it hey there's there's the new girl in town did you know she's the daughter of this and that company and you know oh maybe they're divorced and like the gossip uh, among the students and so on and so on a lot of like the narrative is also reframed through us through gossip like oh what you were in you stayed in tokyo in that hotel oh oh i I love uh, another little parallel about the adults acting a bit like children is we see the girls gossiping about her when the the test results are released and then we immediately have like a scene about the mother talking about her and like the mother was like gossiping with all the other mothers and it's like you know they, they've never grown up yeah. out of that they still like yeah. gossip for like little and, girls yeah there's, de- there's definitely like this air of like like the main character and the main girl are like trying to perform like be mature while everyone else is like completely not trying to <laughs> even the adults uh like f- uh, for instance when the, the main character like distances himself at looking at boobs when when they're playing the tennis like when when the girls are playing tennis uh but then but then like also immediately he pretty much like gets us down by the, the like the new girl and gets brought into that like to what everyone else was like gossiping yeah about. He's, he's still yeah. immature a bit like he'll still yeah. look also Further. i think the tennis scene is interesting because it might be the only example of gynaxing in ghibli that isn't on like an 80 year old woman <laughs> so that's a, that's a first right there. But but I gotta be very. Uh, I think this is a very integral part that when he looks at her, it is very much a constructed fantasy, and I agree with uh, with the takes on this so far. But I guess here we come to a thing I find quite of kind of uh, with which I have discontent and which I kind of not like a lot about this movie is that 
we are introduced to her as this kind of sexual object, as this kind of like idolized figure of admiration and like the boys are fawning over her and even this guy who doesn't even look at the bouncing boobies, he's gone out in enraptured by her, that we don't have anything of her. This entire movie is not consisting of any bits of her personality other than that she's like occasionally able to manipulate the guys very well and just doesn't really let herself through. So I, and this is jumping quite a bit ahead, but I'm really, really weirded out by the fact that by the end, he's like realizing that he's in love with her by, by the very end of the scene uh, of, of the movie and realizes that this girl who he's never really known, who has always just been a fantasy, who has always like been some, something he like admired from like this weird um, gay's perspective is suddenly someone he actually cared about despite not knowing her at all. Like, this is just really weird. So this is why for me a lot of this, when we're talking about her being presented as an object, yes, but I think in the literal sense of the movie is kind of romanticizing this, isn't it? Uh, I, I really disagree with this take, actually. Like, I, I, I've, okay. I view it's like completely the opposite. And uh, tell me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll guess I'll explain why. So... Again, it's all about um, the performative like maturity about it. Where like I think the the key thesis of this movie, if I was to boil it down, would be that like no one ever really becomes an adult. Like kids just start acting like adults, and before they realize it, they're like you know thirty years old and have two kids. Like like no one ever becomes an adult. There is no process. You just do it until you are like fake it till you make it almost. And the movie is trying to kind of explore that through these kids who are, are in their last year of high school and going into college and like trying their hardest to be adults in all these different ways. And we are presented this image of like a very adult, like sexual figure in Rikako and how she's like great at everything and how she's perfect and beautiful. And it's like this very like adult dream. But then when we meet her, we find out that yeah, she's quite childish. She's quite manipulative. She's like quite like, um, She's, like, way more immature than almost any of the other characters. And, like, she's always complaining. She's kind of a spoiled, rich brat. But it's because that, like, we realize that she's always kind of really liked uh, Taku. Like, when we see on the trip to Tokyo, she's the one who, like, he, she comes to to, like, complain and act like a spoiled brat and, like, drink alcohol with trying to be cool and everything. Because, like, she's the only person she'll, like, kind of let her guard down around and actually try to be honest uh, that she's not quite mature. Like, she would never, like, maybe realize this, but, like, in a subconscious level, she's really being herself around him because she I... feels like he's the, one of the people that actually understands her, and she, like, lets all of her frustrations out on him because she, like, kind of wants I, him I to care for her. I don't think there's many moments in this movie where she's honest at all and not even particularly to him. Um, to the no, entirety see, of it, I, I could yeah, only I, I see, see him again. as a useful fool. Okay. No, so, okay, I disagree. Okay. I feel like all the scenes in, in, in Tokyo, like back at the hotel room where she's like complaining about her room and stuff, because she genuinely cares about like, say, the color of her room. I generally believe that she's like so spoiled and like self-obsessed that she does uh, like care about stuff like that. And she's like letting it out because she feels like she has to keep up this appearance around everyone else. But for my, Taku, okay, she my can point just let it all go. Just quickly, uh, my point here is that this is her caring about attention of men and she's replacing her father who is seated giving this attention with this other man who is now doing his best to sleep in the bathtub for her okay this is this is true at first nerd but i i, I think it's right that that's that's isn't wholly honest like he, she's definitely like trying to present him as a um as as this kind of like replacement figure for her father um but she doesn't she's doing so in this kind of haphazard and like she's not she definitely is not as collected as she has been through most of the movie i mean she's literally drunk and she passes out like i don't think yeah. I, I I think her agency in that scene is definitely reduced, um, and that's that's problematic. Um, but you but you see this later, like in the next in the next episode, she definitely is trying to, as as she she says, like brag to him, where she brings her like ex boyfriend over, and she like tries to invite him down and tries to like basically shows off to him. Oh, look at this cool guy I have. But like, I mean, he's not impressed because the guy is a total flop. Um, and speaking to she, my point, <laughs> yeah, no, no, but that's that's what's important. She she he 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 calls the bullshit, and then he goes back upstairs. And then she comes to him and so basically says. Yeah, I was, I was totally being, I was being, I was, I was being really manipulative there and I was trying, I was trying to like impress you. And trying, but like that's, that, that, and that's where the honesty comes. When she like really admits, look, look at what I've been doing. I'm, this is, this is, this, this is, sorry, this is what I've been doing. I've been, I've been, I've been presenting 
myself in these ways and presenting all these different connections. You know, my father figure, my, what well, my father and father figure, my father, my ex-boyfriend, all these, all these, like, these, 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 these like, these, like, these, like, perspectives around me that I'm supposed to be using to impress you, which, I mean, obviously, he's her and, um, sexual goal. Um, I, I think that's pretty clear throughout the movie. Um, but, and she's like, in that scene, she's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I've been doing. And like, she, and she's ashamed of it. And I, I think that, I think that scene is really interesting in that perspective. Yes, but uh, I agree that she realizes what she's done and apologizes because he's seen, seen through it, kind of. I mean, he hasn't. He he's he's halfway on it. He called out the bullshit in that moment, but like he, you know, they w went right back to school and got right back into the same kind of dynamics. She played him like a fiddle again, like the this whole like ignoring stick and then it's, the, it's, the it's, 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 it's and not it's not her it's not it's, it's not her playing him. It's not him playing him. There, I I think. I, I think so much of it is unconscious and so much of it is they're like, they're extremely immature people who are just trying to figure each other and themselves out. Like, there's no playing here. Like, it's, 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 I think, I think if you, I think the perspective of this really starts with the, um, the moment where he lends her money. Um, in the beginning where like that's very clearly she like presents herself oh as like a, a damsel in distress she needs this thing that's 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 the most dishonest she is in the movie but it's interesting because money money is money is really heavily um associated with masculinity in this movie women never have money they're always asking for money men are giving like the, the money the money that oh my father will have money to pay you back um or later in the last, last one in the movie oh um the um the the um the phallic symbol the um castle is lit up by a bunch of lights and i think with electricity and that's that's a waste of money etc there's the, the money is masculine in this movie um but so in that scene she is coming to him in their own like self identified perspectives of masculine femininity where um where where he he, he even, even even when she comes to him she's like oh it's really cool how you work at a job and how you're so mature like that's that's what she understands him as like she he's a masculine figure of of money like that's 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 how the, the characters are presented that's 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 that, that, and that's 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 i think the, the conflict in the movies these characters and their like mythologized ideas of masculine femininity and what these things should have she basically always like depends on him when it comes to financial trouble yeah yeah where, you know, I also like the the with the money that uh I, it's like also a little reflection of how he's still playing this role of an adult where he's working at this uh sushi restaurant but then he just like gets a f f um phone call from his friend and just like ditches and basically says I'm out and like you know he has no responsibility the job is like uh, a role play for him and even with when like literally handing her the money he does like they do a cute little thing where like she hands him a napkin and he like covers it up because they're like afraid yeah, like a uh, for some reason. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a handkerchief to be clear just to make just to be clear how gendered it is he's she's taking her image of of you know like purity this this white like handkerchief which has no money and he's taking the money the masculine image and putting it inside the thing i mean it's 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 it writes it's like that's the, the imagery is very clear here it's it's really weird how much like independency yet immaturity they both have uh <laughs> Like, especially because, like, Rikiko lives alone despite moving with her family. Like, because it kind of, like, distances her from her mother. Uh, like, she, she says that she, like, doesn't need her mother. And then, uh, she also, like, uh, but, uh, mm, <laughs> like, like, she, she says that, but, but then she also gets drunk later and says she doesn't. Uh, so, uh, so, I mean. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that like, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's over. That, 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 sorry, oh. can, can I can I can I just here one one second? Sure. So, um, that that's inter I think that's interesting because um, where where the the impression that he has is oh he doesn't live with she doesn't live with her mother because she resents her mother and wants and doesn't want to like and basically wants to like just like take away from her mother. Like earlier in the movie, um, the the main guy's mother is basically like oh she of course is the mother took the main girl's mother main girl with her to this place. A mother must have her child with her, and so like he is like constructed this idea in her his head of oh she's being selfish she's being cruel to her mother mm -hmm. by living alone but then she like admits when she's drunk oh oh i'm not living with her because it's a, it's a burden on my mother's family and like and like i don't know I, I feel like this like tension between this like maturity and lack of maturity living with the mother or living apart um being cruel to the mother or versus trying to actually like be accommodating and do like and like these mm -hmm. like these different ideas of whether it's impressions versus of, of these people whether what the reality of the people are which i don't think we ever really find out what these people really are like the reality is right. like always like played around the edges of um yeah and you never know what's lying like even when she's drunk you don't know if she's actually like yeah like if she is giving the family some space but uh, uh this this is 
Uh, sorry, I, I, wa- I wanted to talk more about like the actual like independency yet immaturity because it's like kind of an oxymoron that's like gone throughout the movie. Like, like as I mentioned earlier, like the the whole uh, like rolling your eyes over like the, the other classmates looking at boobs uh, and then getting distracted by the new girl, and then uh, and then uh, when he thinks like, oh, uh, my friend is so cool, he thinks twenty years from now, but then it's like over something that literally won't ever matter. When like in twenty years, and uh, and then uh, the ho- like, he he gives money to Rikako, which is reli- reliable. But then he makes a promise of like not telling anyone, which he instantly tells his friend. <laughs> oh yeah, and they get yeah. in a competition about being like the better man because yeah. he borrows her money as well. The, the Matsuno, mm-hmm. when right. he's asked to, you know. Yeah, and and then there's like the very like encapsulation of like performed maturity where um Rikiko uh like she takes like she shows off her technique of well technique she shows off the strength that she found out from a friend coke and whiskey and like like you can all like the sweet flavor of coke is so childish and it's, it's like it's just trying to make like the, the liquor bearable for her and it's like yeah yeah I want alcohol but I want it sweet yeah it's like very immature but but it's cool because I'm drinking alcohol. Oh yeah, Taku's just going for the beer. Yeah, he's like, like, you want beer? No, I want the the, the rum and coke. I think it was rum and coke, but I'm not sure though. It was coke and whiskey, according to my subtitles. All right, mine said rum. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, do yeah, whatever. Yeah, most whiskey and coke as well. Okay, then it's probably whiskey and coke. I don't know. My subs are weird. Whatever. Uh, it's because this movie took a long ass time to get an official Western release uh, to mm. like 2016, I believe, or whatever. It is very late. Um, but I need to get back to a point because we're, we're dancing around it. Like Tassi, you said, uh, we're never sure if they're like being honest. If they, uh, and T- uh, Sandra said this as well, like we're never seeing these true people, which is why I want to look at what the movie's framing narrative is. The movie's, movie's framing narrative is all uh, the train station. I'm at the train station. I see her on the other uh, 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 station. And not station, what's it called? Platform. Platform, thank you. Uh, I see her at the other platform. And then we have the movie uh, as the train's passing between them, basically. And at the end of it, we return to this scene. And he goes up to her and he looks in her face. They smile and we realize, oh, I was in love with her this whole time. Um, I want to return to this as a framing, as an extremely important framing. This is kind of uh, what the movie is going for. Like he loves her and now i want to tell you why specifically i've i really dislike this thing again by saying that i agree with you that during the entirety of the flashbacks we never really learn who she is we never really see past this uh reverse manic pixie dream girl uh, like depressed pixie dream girl facade that she is she's just appearing to be saved by those two men who compete over saving her one guy punches the other uh, the guy punches the girl right this whole abusive dynamic unfolds and we return after we grow up and, s- and look back at the memories and say like oh use how wild how childish and stand in front of her and think wow i love her despite the fact that she never ceased being an object, despite the fact that she never escaped any of these uh, powered struggles between the men. And I just find it extremely uh, weird that the entire movie is set up to show us how kind of absurd this mythologization of the other person is, and then to return and say, but I love her anyways, because yeah. apparently there was something true to it. Okay, a couple D- things dis- to it. Despite but, the fact that the closest, like, the closest thing they, they ever touched was like the smack of each other's hands. Yeah, that's like the <laughs> physical, the entirety of physical contact. But even despite that, right, the idea is that they're performing for each other, that both are being shitty to to each other, kind of like he's all right. I mean, he's kind of complying to whatever she demands and he's not letting her dance on his uh, dance, you know, use him completely. Mm-hmm. He's standing up that moment where he's being exploited to be shown off as a boyfriend or whatever. But I just really got to say, like, I don't fucking understand why he's in love with her by the end of it, other than that it's some weird romanticization of this weird objectification and performative maturity okay. and masculinity. There, so a couple things. First, you need to understand that in the fact that like it's unclear whether what is true and what's not true isn't about whether she's lying or not lying. It's it's, it's more complicated than that. It's, it's more like there's a it's unclearness whether what's performative 
like what's what's performative like what's her performing masculine femininity what's her performing her like pers- yeah, her yeah. role in the scene and I mean what that, is yeah. her herself but like the thing is it's not that is also her these performative aspects of her these aren't these aren't like things that are like there's I mean there's there's, there's I and mean, there's definitely a, there, I think the movie reveals this kind of question of like what is her like it's not it's not like what what he loves about her I think is a I mean a I think it is it is this romanticization of her like undetainable feminine feminine nature like this I mean she serves the mythological feminine role like oh, that's, yeah. that's, and that's also that's, the woman that's you totally. get to fix that's also in in there well he doesn't fix her that's, that's I that's not true but, at all you 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 you're you're you're, 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 you're into her. No, you're, you're projecting there. Um, that has no, nothing to do with no, the movie. No, 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 no. That's in there. Come on. <laughs> no, it, no, it, 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 it's in there at all. Throughout the entirety of the movie, she's always in need of helping or asking for help. The entirety of his shtick is that she's the outsider girl and you could stand up yeah. for her. And he doesn't. Matsuno uh, uh, is angry about that as well. Yeah, well, he doesn't. I would say part of her shtick is also... Like, I would say part of her stick is also that she is dependent beca- because like, there's a reason that he doesn't help her in the end. Uh, mm-hmm. When she's being confronted by all the, all the girls. And I would say that that was because he thought she was being dependent, but she thought that, like, she just wanted someone to stand up for her, obviously, but he, he didn't come because yeah, of that. Yeah, I think that's, that's she like the ending, much of like, love, <laughs> that's like the ending love moment where it's like, um, shit, what am I trying to say? The, she, she always depended on him and he never recognized this. He never like kind of realized that she actually mm-hmm. was always trying to be dependent on him and like have be someone that she could have an emotional connection to when she's so isolated in this town where she doesn't like anyone. And he doesn't realize that. And that's why she's so angry that he doesn't stick up for her yeah. when the girls are bullying her and she like slaps him because she, he doesn't like realize that she put so much emotional weight behind him. And then when we are told by the uh, friend that she likes a boy who sleeps in bathtubs, we realize that that's her acknowledging what he was doing for her, because he always felt like she was never she was never acknowledging it or appreciating it. But she does realize that he was making little sacrifices for her the whole time, and they've kind of both come to understand each other now. And of course, we get the whole symbolism of the beginning of the movie. They're on separate train platforms, then they're together on the end. Nice little, nice little bit there. Am I the only one who thinks that this is an incredibly fucked up relationship that I'm making a weird fetishization of this dependency? Um, a little bit, I guess, but I don't know. They're, if they're both, they're both the people who have these issues and are trying to be dependent on each other in a way. So, and I, so I don't know. Those people are people who end up codependent and abusive, like they did to each other when they hit each other. This is not really something that we would romant- would want to romanticize and end up in like a fated re-encounter ending where we're like, oh, but it was true love all along. Like, how long are they going to go before they slap each other again? Go on. Okay, I so- don't know. That's the feeling I got from the movie, right? This, this is No, I don't feel that because there's also really the entire out. keyed in theme of maturity and how like in the end of the movie, they're both understanding like their adult positions in this. So I don't think they'd be as like stupidly okay, I, childish as I, before. I, I don't think they matured all that much. Your point earlier was great that you don't end up suddenly as an adult, but it's like a process that you fake it until you make it. Uh, the class reunion was like an an orgy of childishness of, oh, who's going to propose next? And yeah, let's drink ourselves to death and re- reminisce about the fun times and so on. And after this childish bout of, uh, let me confess, let me confess, like not a real, like um, a mature like thing, but like a game kind of out of let's cheer for the next person who will confess. Um, this is kind of where he got the idea. I think that he's like, oh, maybe, you know, thinking back, there is some love that that needs to be admitted. So I don't think the, the encounter at the end is like some embodiment of their newfound maturity and their reflection upon their uh, 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 their childishness, but more or less that he's now just admitting his love for her, I suppose. Like, it's weird. I I, I can't really... Figure it all okay. out, but Can I, I think you're misreading that. That's that scene. Um, so in that scene, th- all these characters are like, you know, they're they're having this. It is definitely very childish. They're like they're like all drinking. They're all. But you, but you look at when you go to the corner where the main character, his friend, and the um, what's her face, the um, the, the girl. She doesn't have a name. She's yeah, just she's a, a name. girl's representative. Look, yeah, the girl's representative. Um, 
yeah. Um, and, and, and they have this like quiet, like mature, like conversation where they kind of reflect on the past. And, and, and while they're reflecting on the past and talking about it and how like they, they, I mean, they just didn't necessarily get along or whatever. And so they, they comment on each other's, Oh, you're wearing lipstick now. You're, you're performing all these like adult things. Um, while at the same time, there's this like kind of like raucous, like, this, like everyone like, like drinking and yelling and like the, having the game out of confessions where that's, and I, I think those two, that, that, that scene perfectly represents this tension between the maturity and the like childishness of the all these characters and and so like so he like is in this mature space this um, pseudo mature space where he's talking with her and performing this like kind of maturity where at the same time there's this he's being constantly reminded of his childhood memories of all these things and of the childishness of those things that's and that's where he that's the space where he comes into the memory for it's it's not in a space of childishness it's in a space of maturity looking at a space of childishness and understanding how those things need to be resolved in a more serious manner so that's, that's yeah, what's going on. I felt there. that, uh, that the whole scene in the bar was quite effective for the, the, like, the, again, the, the thesis on maturity where it's, yeah, we're, we're, all the girls are like now wearing makeups and earrings. Like uh, pretty much all the characters' designs have like noticeably, uh, getting more mature features through like the, the anime language we're all aware of. And it's, it's only been like a year, they say. They've just been to college for a year and they're already like drinking heavily and being, like party animals and it's like um that's like how adults kind of remain because you see that in like uh tons of other stuff like uh office workers in their 40s who just get like really drunk and do stupid stuff because like it's kind of like that everyone's still a child in a in a lot of ways and i think uh it's kind of a good example for all the stupid confessions because yeah everyone's acting all silly and cheering it but it's like they're letting go of all those silly things that stop them when they were in high school because they were like too embarrassed about confessing to someone but now that they're adults they can be like well yeah i like you do you want to go out like they can just be mature about it now and that's what our main character kind of realizes so as well what you're saying is they learn to get past the inhibitions that they had in their childish um, um positions toward this and then fully embrace the objectification and the like mythologization of the women they admired as crushes in high school. Like the 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 big guy, the big guy who says, "Oh, Yumi, she was always in the shadow of Rikako." But you, you know, as a keen man, you gotta see what the good stuff is. You know, you gotta look past that. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you you love her because you objectify her. Great. Like you will let go of the inhibitions, just go for the pure objectification. That's my take. Sorry, but I feel like our protagonist did literally the same thing by going up to her by the end and feeling, oh, I'm in love with her because there is no her in his mind, in my view, still, because it's only fantasy. Okay, I, I think I think at that point when you ask the question, what what is really what is what is the framing device of this movie? It's not the train station is just there is a is a jumping off point to what the actual framing device of the movie is, which is his memories of the as past. As well as the photo. Yes, the the very beginning of the movie, you see him like think he's on the train station. He see he he, he looks up around the train and sees her, and then he um th th then then it flashes to the past. But the past isn't flashed to like in like just like there's like a, what what happens is there's a there's a there's a um a border. The, the screen like shrinks and there's a there's a there's a white thing where the, the um, Activator has basically been shrinked by this white background. Where the what's happening in this in this in the frame is this tiny little, this tiny little um um area of the screen in the middle um in this in this rectangle in the middle um and then expands a little bit and then throughout a lot of the beginning of the areas there's these there the the, the movie will like do something and then it will have like, a hard cut. Um, into something different, into, into like, and, and then often the, the white background will come back and, um, constrain the, the, um, the, the movie in. And one of the first scenes of the movie is, 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 um, him in his room with a, a postcard of, of her, um, showing that, um, um, it's, 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 it's a picture, but it's definitely presented as kind of like this postcard, this memory of her of the past, like this, like, um, I mean, um, we, we learn later the that he's. picture he um, bought. Um, it's not a bikini; it's a one piece. But um, oh, well, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, it's a, yeah, you bought that. Uh, um, it's a bathing suit. Supposed but um, what, what 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 these things are doing is these things are are trying to show very explicitly how, if you want to use objectify, I think that's that's actually probably the good word here. Objectify these images of the past are like every single image is this postcard, this commodified like area, this thing he he bought this picture. It's it's these 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 memories that are these these constructed memories of what the past are and what 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 he lived in why why he became close friends with um um glasses guy um 
uh, blanking the name again. Um, Matsuno. Matsuno is because he saw on his on his little letter he wrote about protesting the end of the school, the, the um, death of the school vacation, um, saying that, oh, he thinks 20 years into the future. And he's like, wow, the person thinks 20 years into the future. Where in the whole movie, he's thinking backwards. And so this whole like perspective where maturity is tied to time, where oh, well, one was mature in 20 years, where one is not mature when one looks backwards. But this gets, it gets confused to the whole movie. So... So in buying this picture of her, he does it um, as a quote unquote revenge because she, um, cause after, after, after borrowing the money from him and then being mean to him about it, um, from his perspective, um, he, 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 he buys this commodified postcard. And so the entire movie, every single, every single memory is him thinking, Oh, this is the thing that happened and him trying to understand, trying to create a image, trying to create a, very understandable, contained, or literally spatially, like frame wise contained, um, perspective of what the, what, what the picture is, what the object, what, what is, what, what the object is. Um, and so he, he picks these very specific locations and where he's trying to, he's trying to, he's trying to read this, these, 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 um, ideas of the person is. And see, one of the, the, the most like, you know, the, the other apotheosis scene in the movie comes when he's at the, um, when he's outside with, at, at, after the, um, class reunion and he sees the, the castle all lit up with lights where he thinks, oh, um, I, I, th- I used to think it was a waste of, of money, of electricity, of money to, um, to light, to light this castle up, but, the, and, but now, and he doesn't really explain why he likes it now, but he just, he kind of does. And then there's a bunch of flashing of pictures of her. And they're like very, they're, they're postcard. They're, they're images of his understanding of their relationship, of their, the different like scenes. Like, so every single moment in the movie is a postcard of his understanding of her. There's never a time where the movie gets out of the space of, Oh, I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to find what is, what, it's not even true. What is, what is true and what's not true, but what is she? Like, what, what, what is this, this object? Like, I, I, so I, I totally agree there, but I think that's because of how the, f- how the movie frames it relationship. The movie commodifies and reduces these, I, these memories, these ideas down to these different snapshots of a person. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree for the most part. Yeah. But because nothing you said really challenged my fundamental discontent here, which is that, somehow out of this purely objectified like recollection we draw real love as a romantic movie climax that is not supposed to be weird and alienating to us but indeed like fill us with emotion and passion i believe well i I think emotion passion the wrong thing it's very it's definitely the movie is definitely like hands off with that kind of thing it's the movie not trying to trying to leave a slight smile not a movie trying to oh i disagree look at the final scene like the background blurs out it's just her smiling at the center of the frame like yeah no the holy grail it's, but, that he just achieved to complete his <laughs> maturity and masculinity no no definitely not no because every single moment every single song in the movie is so like it's like it's like there's this cutesy this little like this synth this kind of like this memory of the past there's nothing there's never there's, the movie's never trying to make you cry there's there's never an attempt of that um, when, when, it, when it blurs out and shows you this image of her, it's trying to show you, look, this is an image of her. This is a, this is, this, this is my picture of her. Like, I, I, and I think he's really honest. He's not, he's not, it's, it's not a, it's not like a negative. It's not like this kind of like, um, dangerous, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm turning her into my, into my audience. It's, it's, it's him saying, this is the image I have created of you. And like, and that's what I'm in love with. And that's, and that's all one can really understand of a person. Like, everything, every single relationship these characters have is not, almost none of it is actual direct rea- relationship. It's them understanding understanding each other through these lenses through oh my friend said this about you oh my friend said this about you oh the gossip is this the gossip is this um but they do have a few moments of real like like connection like um say like when she gets drunk with him or um after af- after um he she tries to show up her boyfriend so and these and these images get get uh, tied in but like there's never a separation between these quote-unquote real scenes with these quote-unquote like um um impressions these fake these um manipulations um I mean, and so, I agree and, that, the, okay, Follow, um, conclude. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the image of that he's creating of her and the image that's, that's present entirely through is not, it's not real, but that's kind of okay, I think. And that's what, I think that's what the movie is trying to say is that so, these images are, are romanticized. They are really tied up in these masculine, feminine, like, present, this, this whole, like, fetishized. Like he's, he's, yeah. Yes. They're, they are, fe- yes, they are fetishized. Um, and I think the movie is saying that's okay because there is something real. There's, there's a real connection. They, they've have, they do have an understanding of each other that they don't of other people that, that they, they come to this conclusion at the end. And it's not, it's definitely not like complete and total and like, and the most like deep, like connection one can have, but it's like kind of all they can get because they can't really understand each other directly. They can only show you through so, the images. I agree that all this is what the directing does, but I believe as a response to what my point was, it is kind of like avoiding the discussion. And the discussion I had was um, whether or not this kind of romanticization is problematic. 
right? This idea. Oh yeah, of, I, I, uh, I, I I totally agree. That it's problematic. Like, I think it's it's sophisticated. Uh, um, I mean, I agree that it's kind of sophisticated. I guess someone went really far to like. Because, and the interesting thing, and I wanted to mention this, it goes both ways, right? It's both like this uh, sophisticated fetish fantasy for men and for women, like watching this, uh, uh, not to essentialize like people, but um, as as a boy, you can like self insert into the guy and you have this, all this like agency, a good job. Like you get into these interesting situations with a girl, you get to take care of her, you get to help her solve her weird issues, but you're not doing it, right? You're, but but you're just there. You get to experience the insights and the hidden secrets of this weird, uh, ethereal, ephemeral, like uh, mythologized girl. And as a girl, you get to imagine to be that girl who's admired by all, who's so troubled, who's like uh, torn on the inside, but there's someone who takes care of you, who you can rely on despite like your failures as like being a nice person <laughs> and being a nice person. You know, I, I feel like this is a fetishization in both ways. And I, I was really made uncomfortable by it, to be honest. Like this romantic chemistry is absolutely absent and like the conclusion just leaves me um, distressed. Let's be real. Uh, that's that's why I'm that's why I'm getting off with this movie. Really, um, I don't know. Like, I guess you can, yeah, you can argue like it's problematic from that perspective. But I will say that I do feel like, like again, the movie's trying to go for this kind of realism aspect, and in the end, to me, it does kind of feel like a real relationship. Like, uh, oh, Sandra was saying <laughs> that like people can only ever create an image of another person in their mind. Like, you can never, you know, truly know someone in like that. Uh, like deep m- m- Klingon, I mean, Vulcan mind melding sense, you know, you can only ever really create an image of someone as detailed as possible, but it's still uh, distinctly an other. And this I mean, film, yeah. it really does, yeah. does try to feel like it, they both come to a, a a close image. And I do feel the ending is less about this romantic completion as it is them both being adults now and realizing they can like move forward and like understand each other now like this is the beginning of a relationship this is not like with only yesterday we're like we're putting the the, the ceiling final kiss on it with the ending mm. sequence so so i agree because if we follow the relationship throughout the whole movie it starts with him romanticizing her and objectifying her as this thing but then he grows disillusioned by her feeling that she's like a spoiled brat so he doesn't really like feel like treating her like that anymore and then she gets angry at him and they slap each other in that scene. And that's like him showing her that he's treating her as an equal now. Like he's hitting her back. He's like, doesn't want this relationship to be a, an imbalance of power from any perspective. And then he leaves her to herself to get bullied by the girls. And then that's when she slaps him and re- like, that's reestablishing that she wants to be protected in a sense. She wants something from him. She wants to rely on him. And so- then finally, when he's told about the bath, uh, like he was the guy sleeping in the bath and that's what she thinks of him. She re- He realizes that she really does like understand what he can do for her and how she can rely on him and how he can rely on her. And there's, so in the end sequence, meeting on the train platform, they're both like adults now who understand what they can do for each other. And yeah, I guess it could be a pretty unhealthy relationship, but mm. I do feel that it's trying to create a complete image of how these two people come together. So... I agree with most of what you said, but I need to, I guess, stress what I believe is the function of nostalgia in this movie. It is college kids and so on getting together at this class reunion to kind of reminisce and to like re-examine their past crushes, I I think, and like confess and so on and so on, and just move into maturity. And I agree with all of that. But the weird thing is that kind of, it seems to me like this wistful wish that these troubles and these ocean waves of youth may return in some capacity once more and that this troubled youthful relationship is something that they both kind of desire to get back for this very reason. So I believe this feeds even more into this, like not as much a growing up, because I believe growing up is when you, I believe growing up is when you get out of these weird objectified, mutually objectified codependent relationships and recognize like your own I guess healthy limits and your own like self-worth not defined through like the the other as much and we return at the end of this movie at least in my feeling through a nostalgia lens to a completely like re-objectified uh love 
at least re-recover this nostalgic objectification, this troubled time of youth, and re-restore it by re-encountering uh, by a re-encounter between these two uh, former not, not lovers, but you know. Uh, players on the stage <laughs> yeah <laughs> see, I, I guess my, my difference to you is that uh i can't really like i can't really might come down that hard on either side of it because i feel like a lot of what the movie does with the final like minutes of the film it feels like it's yeah like we've we've recovered that like nostalgic thing but it means we can like like move forward in a sense like that because mm -hmm. that's to me is the whole thing oh yeah. shit sorry give me a sec all right uh, um yeah go ahead uh, yeah, I, f I feel like the movie also like tries to kind of disavow the, the, the nostalgia of like, well, not so much disavow the nostalgia, but like it tries to disavow itself from its previous actions in like what matters in the movie. Like it, it talks about like uh, worlds and like the sizes of the worlds. So like, for, for example, like, uh, in the, cl like in a classroom, uh, the girl's representative brings up the example of when you, uh, switch seats to, to next to someone that you really hate and, uh, how you just don't want to go to school anymore. But if your world is slightly broadened, if you maybe have like p piano lessons on the side, suddenly that becomes bearable. And, uh, as you move on into something that's not school, something that's bigger than school, suddenly like all the worries of school becomes like fucking nothing. Uh, like, for example, with the friend, uh, his issues in school was like, uh, this beautiful girl just transferred. I, I must tell my friend, uh, I met her at the library and there might be something up. And, and of course he calls her, uh, him at every single opportunity. Like I saw her and she was alone on her bed. Uh, basically just like what teenagers focus on. And then, uh, and then you see them again, like at the end of the movie, like all grown up, like, um, the amount of time, like they talk about like the amount of time it takes to to get anywhere and how to readjust to a new city and and stuff and it's like it's very mature seeming hold on um i i i also think it's kind of kind of interesting in this perspective um how um how they sh they they seem to try to shove their like they they, they they just as much as they mythologize each other's masculine femininity they try to like shove each other's masculine femininity into each other like they're like um, like for example, like, um, when they're at the airport and uh, he comes to the airport, to, oh, look how, look how, look, he, he comes to the airport, um, to like, you know, to help, um, Rikaku's friend not have to go to Tokyo because she really doesn't want to go. She's from a, from a good family and she doesn't want to lie to her parents. Um, and so he like, comes and, and, and like, and, like helps her like get out and like he looks so smug, like, oh, look at me. I'm just like, I helped the girl out. I'm doing my role as a, as a man. And then she's like, oh, I feel ill. I, I have, I have, I, I have my period right now and like, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. I mean, like, obviously there's like a problematic nature of like, you know, like she's defining womanhood as suffering. He's defining, um, masculinity as, um, being able to like help women in their suffering, but like they're using it as weapons against each other. Um, and I, don't know, I just thought that that's, I just thought it was an interesting scene to, to, to mention. Like they're not, it's not, there's, there's definitely like, as, 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 as hipster said, like about the flaps, there's definitely like an equalness to their, um, Due to the back of the violence they use oh, yeah. against each other to try, try to um, when he when he slaps her he's violating code like the masculine yeah. code and that's kind of important and where I believe like his performance ends like he's genuinely fed up with this shit like he's genuinely and I, I, I can't blame the guy right this is just a shitty place for him to be in yeah like, he's done all the right things he's tried to like be nice to her and like helped out and what whatsoever like it's I'm gonna be I'm gonna have to say, like, he's not even that presumptuous about it, right? He's not like he 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 likes imagining himself as a savior, but he has been called by someone who wanted help, you know, and he has accompanied her to help her, like genuinely. So I believe it's kind of like rough what he got here. Maybe, but we also you also need to know that it entirely comes from his perspective. This movie, like he is, he's he has all the power in this relationship. In the in really, like he's he's the one controlling the memory. Like not necessarily, I don't I don't think the power in this relationship, but he's the one controlling how we see the memories of the relationship. And he's almost always he's the one with the um. With, with, he's the one with the agency. He's the one like yeah. she, 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 she's the one who's put in a bit of oh, where she's like surrounded by other girls in the class who are being kind to her. And he has the choice, oh, to go help her, or not to help her, where he chooses not to. Um, but and but she, I, she never, I, she never I, has that choice. I wanna, 
ask though, right? If he is in charge of the storytelling, if he can present his narrative only, and we understand that this gives him a lot of agency and her none, I kind of believe that if that would actually be a real thing that matters to the text, the text would at least put reference in to say that her side of the story might have looked substantially different, don't you think? Like, if there was such a point being made? Well... I think that you, you, you kind of, it kind of slips in through. I think this movie's about the things that slip in through the cracks in this way. Like you kind of like, like he's like presenting all, oh, like, 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 as I said, like in, in that, in that scene where he's like, Oh, look, I saved this girl. Look at me. Look, wow. You're being so mean to her. And she's like, Oh, I, I have, I have my, my period right now. I'm, I can't like deal with this, like this performative shit in, in the way that she is performing in that way. But, um, and, but like, so like all these times where like you have like him trying to present himself as a hero, him present, present himself in these certain ways and him trying to objectify, create this image of her. Um, you like a lot of these times, like you'll have like her, her, her like confirm his suspicions and do something like, oh, ask him for money, do these things that, oh, he's that, that, that a, a woman or this woman is supposed to do in these, these, these correct vignettes. But then you have times like, 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 like the time where he goes to sleep in the back, where she just like gets drunk and falls asleep in, in the bed. And she's like, she's talking about how she, um, she doesn't live with her mother because, um, she does, because she doesn't want to, to, to be a burden on her mother's family because her mother's family is like having a lot of trouble. Um, and scenes like those where you kind of see, oh, she's, 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 it's not that she's dealing with a lot. That's, that, that's also, that's also a negative objective, but, but she's, she's making the choice to live in a different space. She's making the choice to, she makes, she, she, the thing is, I think the cracks show that she does have agency. He just isn't presenting her really have agency because she doesn't, he can't really understand her agency because he's so concerned with his um, masculine feminine role. And I actually, I don't think the movie necessarily comments on this because I think the movie is kind of stuck in this, but I think it's an interesting, like, as in, I don't think the, the, the people making the movie, I think the movie, the people making the movie really were stuck in this mythologized idea of gender and, like, objectivity and the like. But uh, I think the movie itself okay. is, like, has these interesting ideas where these ideas slip so, into the cracks. So- so you're largely basically agreeing with my criticism in this way because you also agree that this movie is really stuck in these ideas. Yeah, totally. In these romanticizations, fetishizations. But you, you're you trying to like see what's in the cracks, what's showing in those cracks. Yeah, because I think that's what okay, makes the movie really interesting. Idea. Because because the movie is objectively a, is, is about these memories, about these like it's about ocean waves. Like you only see the ocean once in the, in the movie. Like most of the time, the ocean is just they mention. Oh, you can kind of hear it in the background. Like they talk about that a couple of times. Where that's it's, it's that the truth kind of is always on the, the margins in those like little like whiteness that happens at the edge of the screen to show you that everything's a flashback. That and that's where I think the meaning in this movie comes from. These outside spaces these like things where the, not what the movie is addressing but the things that the movie doesn't address you know what i mean and that's why i think this movie is really interesting in that way oh it's, it's certainly interesting uh to think about it in this way yeah huh um i wonder if in this context it matters at all that um we, because it's an adaptation, right? And we don't have the original source material at hand and we haven't read it. And adaptations, of course, always make their own thing. But are we, if we are to believe, like the camera obviously does a lot of the objectifying in this movie as well. Like, uh, And this obviously is not present in the adaptation, uh, in the original uh, uh, novel. So I find it kind of interesting to compare then a difference, at least a difference that I am I have been made aware of through my research, which is that the ending is basically an uh, uh, anime invention. Because in the novel, it appears that she did end up showing up at the class reunion and she was just there in a sort of anticlimactic way. At least the one synopsis I read commented on it being anticlimactic. And the, and the book actually has a sequel which continues to dive into their romance and like explore it and it does appear just to take it away a little bit it does appear to mainly center around the difference between city and uh uh, uh, the countryside because uh, i'm having many thoughts about this right now but interestingly enough the movie is called ocean waves and we don't really have any ocean waves but it's referring to the island right it's kochi island it's a very rural kind of out there island like at the at the beach basically uh all around they can always like from their their city travel to the beach immediately but it's never shown and as far as i made aware of the sequel like the the second novel actually does go into these dynamics of of of, of city versus uh, the countryside where it does appear that the girl through some acts of uh, romantic and uh, social engagement does appear to finally identify herself with the countryside because we haven't explored this 
aspect it, right? She's like, oh, yo, weird accent. I don't like this. Like the Kochi accent, you sound like a samurai and so on. Like this dichotomy of city versus uh, uh, non-city life is there. And it feels to be more central in the books than it is in the film. So I don't know. What are your takes on this all? I have none. It, Cricket. have none. Cr crickets are, are chirping right yeah. now. <laughs> because in a sense, it kind of like this reframing to me, and I'm very uncharitable, you know, I, I'm an asshole. Um, this feels to me like it's kind of like a city girl needing to be socialized into the um, um, rural landscape thing. The thing that you like to accuse only yesterday of, fortunately not in the podcast because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's not in the movie. It has been changed. I want to think about what this change means other than this, right? This, uh, When talking about adaptation, I'm always like very co uh, convinced of the idea that the work at hand, like the movie, is its own artistic yeah. piece obviously it's not Agreed. tied up by its adaptation but i like to think about what they have chosen to change well so i i think like how the, how the city is working is i think it's working in a couple ways like, like tokyo is is, is is gone to twice the movie first in the time to go and see um Ikaku's father um and, and in that in that mode i think i think it's it's tokyo is clearly serving as this kind of this um Uh, to continue to like mythological, like it's it's the woods, it's it's the place, it's the weird, dangerous place that one one goes to, like you know, get um self like to, to, to reach enlightenment, whatever, whatever. Like it's 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 the place where you maturity, go, yeah, to, yeah, to change the the, the 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 liminal space of the movie, um, yeah. is, is 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 Tokyo. So I, I and and later in the movie, it's the place where they go, the place where they go to expand. Like as you said, maturity. It's like when they go to Tokyo, their world is expanding. Things take hours to get around in. Like people have um. Like, the world is this bigger. You don't necessarily just run into all of your friends all the time. Like it takes like a chance meeting on a subway to meet the long lost love of your life. Um, <laughs> um, so it's like, it's like, I think, I think, I think they've, they've transformed. I, I don't know how the, the, the novel does this, but like in this movie, they definitely, they're, 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 I think they're focusing on Tokyo. It's, it is as this space of maturity, of the space of where one can change, this liminal space, a space where things are in flux, where on the island things are, um, made into a postcard things are um things things are things are are are, are cemented in these these memories and these like exact like objectified clear images where everyone knows each other there's a castle with that like looms over everything there's nothing everything everything is connected everything is like one on the island so like and i almost see like the movie is him trying to sort through the oneness of the island and understand it so we can move on through life in a multi um dimensional cosmopolitan area i don't know so I, I think that's kind of what they're doing with the urban versus. I think there's, there's a lot more you so, can say about Kochi, but that's like my like broad thoughts in, on it. Interestingly enough, uh, in Tokyo, he has a moment where he's like, "Now I feel like I, I I'm, I'm 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 at ease here." Basically, uh, when he's taking the walk um, around Tokyo, uh, I wonder what this kind of means. What position did he arrive in there? I, oh, fuck, I don't really recall exactly the moment when he does it, it though. It was just when uh, he saw Rikako be able to bounce back in Tokyo, so that gave him like inspiration to be in Tokyo. K kinda. Yeah. Yeah. This, I I feel like there's so much like all the baggage in the movie comes from come comes from the 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 the, 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 the um the countryside it comes from Kochi. But when they go to Tokyo, there's kind of like way where they're they're almost free. They they can they can act as quote unquote adults. But they mm -hmm. like they like they sleep in a, a room together. I mean, they're still there's still like the immaturity there. But they're allowed these they're they're allowed to like experiment. They're allowed to do things. Where in the where in the, there's there's no there's no gossip following them everywhere. Um, where like when they're back in Kochi, every you can't do anything. Like they get back to Kochi and everyone talks about their ship or how they slept in the same room together. And like those. Co Kochi is so small and so stifling and so like it's it's old fashioned. It's, everything's the past. Where I feel like there's, I think mean, Tokyo is like juxtaposed as this, this future, the space where people can can act freely, where people can express their maturity or immaturity in equal measures and be honest. Because I think they're they're yeah. most honest in Tokyo. Whether in Kochi, no one is ever honest. I think this is when I decided that I would go to college in Tokyo. Is also what he decides in that uh, very moment when he realizes that he's now at ease here. It's kind of interesting because this is really a space where all the maturity performances like take a peek. She's dressing up to meet her ex-boyfriend to impress him. He's dead drinking. That he's like, oh, I'm gonna go study here and so on and so on. 
And I think this gives more credence to what Hipster said earlier, right? The the idea that by the, by the end they've reached some form of maturity when they're meeting again, because they are in Tokyo, which is that space, which is exactly where we would expect the maturity to linger following this movie's logic. So, I... You know, also, it I, comes back to my point about the uh, the architecture, where we get like these looming buildings, but they're only oh, yeah. like you know a couple of stories high, and the castle's pretty big. But then Tokyo, the skyscrapers are just like blowing that out of the water. He sees like just a, there's a good shot of like just an apartment block, but it's like you know like fifty stories high, and that's and that's just like a normal sight in Tokyo. So it's that more idea of like the true adult world. Yeah, yeah there's this like there's this secret castle where which captures all the past of your all the past generations looking down on you electric like lit up with the with the lights that are just like looming on you the the, the, lar- the large building is just kind of there like no one people aren't commenting on them people aren't like obsessed with them there isn't this they aren't they aren't they're they're, they're very clearly not presented as phallic figures like the the clock tower in their school or the um or the castle which i think is, is pretty interesting even though they're they're far larger so i'm getting to i guess uh, a sort of uh more coherent opinion on this movie which seems to me that a lot of imagery and uh, thematic threads are carried over from the novel that are kind of rudimentary in here right as we see the movie focuses and zones in exactly on the love triangle and speaking of love triangle we've not talked about Matsuno much so what did, what do you think about him? Like for me, he's the kind of this. He is the 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 first to scope out this new girl. He's the first to objectify her. He's the first who tries to possess her, like in a kind of jealous way, even. And yeah, he's he's wearing glasses. He's little literally the yeah. lens in which the main character sees the yeah, girl. For me, Matsuno, <laughs> he kind of represents again that that border point between maturity and immaturity, where. Um, he 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 on the surface and everyone thinks he's like super mature because you know he like raised his hands in protest against this the teachers and he even says um i'll never forgive this you know even when i'm a, an adult and they put such like weight on being an adult even when i'm an adult i'll still think this is like wrong and i'll still think that uh, i knew better then so everyone thinks matsuno is like this super mature guy but he never ends up like um learning anything about rikako or like like coming to any kind of terms with her yeah and that's all, all, all that taku does because like i said he goes through these different stages this like synthesis of like objectifying her then understanding her immaturity and then like coming to a conclusion so, at the end but in the end he yeah. realizes that he never like stood a chance because he didn't know anything about her in the end and that's why we get the also, sequence where they're yeah. in college and they're kind of talking about it and he's like forgiven him and like kind of is sorry that he punched him because he realized that in the end, he, he he didn't know what he was doing. Like he just had this idea in his head, and he didn't realize Taku was actually the more mature one in that instance. Yeah, so, it, it, it's interesting because um because his friend only sees her in these these, these very objectified image perspectives. Like what he he calls him up his friend saying, "Oh, I saw her in her bed alone," yeah. and he's like, "And what about that? Oh." That, that that's that that's it that's that's the depth of his relationship he he is the one who like i, I think and it's contrasting like the pure objectification of of, of him versus the, the main character who has it definitely is objectifying her and making an image of her but is trying to make a is trying to make an attempt to understand her and is kind of as you said synthesizing all these different ideas of her into these images he is creating of her rather than just looking so, at her on the, the um, thing and there's one, one more thing um there's also, also, it's interesting to note that um, the last time, he, like, the, 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 we, we know, no one's talked about this, but the fact when he goes and punches the main character, um, the glasses guy, um, Mutaku, Matsuno his punches uh, Matsuno. Morisaki. That's his name. Yeah, Matsuno punches, punches Morisaki. I don't know why I can't remember these right names. Um, he um, he's doing it not because he's upset that the main character is you know take, quote unquote taking away his love, or not because he he didn't save the the girl. Because I I think like this 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 scene shows that like I mean she wants to be present, but really like she needed to like get through that scene herself. But really, what it's showing is he's what he shows. He's, he's mad at her. He tells her later, I, I I was mad at you because you didn't save her because you wanted to be kind to me. Um, and that that I thought was really interesting because like. Um, like the main, like I mean, the, the, this this guy, you know, it's like, oh, oh, wow, you gotta leave the respect the, the, the girl the, that my, my this person's love with it. It's kind of kind of like shitty, like high school thing. But um, um, 
it's 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 interesting because like he's expressing all this like like he's like so soft spoken he's so like oh he's like he's the mature guy he's like careful he's all responsible but like in that scene where he goes and like like smacks the main character because the main character just won't won't, won't, is so like quote unquote respecting of him that he feels like almost insulted in this like regard where like um he doesn't he won't won't go and stand up for the for for for, um for uh, rikaku or anything like that i I don't know i i I kind of forgot where i was going into this but so it's pretty interesting maybe maybe to add to this or kind of rebut even i believe even here the movie is kind of tripping over itself a little bit because um in an earlier scene we see him um after the whole pe class has peeped at the girls he's really mad about this he's really angry at his friends like he's 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 like uh, uh i i don't know like what he exactly says i don't recall quite the line but he's angry at him and just a moment later he apologizes and for me this comes up with like a very possessive gesture like he sculpted her out like sure he shared his uh his, yeah. his findings yeah, with no, his totally. body first but now everyone is looking and he's like no he's claiming ownership he's no it's my yeah. it's, it's my girl i'm looking at her that, 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 yeah, through the whole movie, he is, he has, he has this, this, this objectified image of her where, oh, he's the one who, like, saw her first. He's the one who, his gaze is the one that's supposed to be, have primacy, and he is, like, convinced of that. And I think that the punches where he realized, where he punches the main characters, where he realized, oh, and that's not, this is such a, like, destructive, silly, immature way of looking at things. This is, and he punches him because he's mad because the main character is respecting his kind of really toxic way of approaching this girl, of an approaching of his gaze and his, like, and the controlling nature. I don't know. That, that, that's, that's how I kind of read that. Uh, it's really good. Uh, maybe it was just the way that it was translated, I so I don't know the exact words they're using in the Japanese. But I like that uh, we get the scene where he does the very like cliched, innocent confession to her on the bridge. Uh, Matsuno does, and he's like, you know, I'm in love with you. But it's like he doesn't know her at all. He knows nothing about her. But then our main character at the end of the movie, he's like, I think the the subtitles say, I was always crazy about her. Because it's not like that he's in love with her. He's just like, yeah, I did have a kind of a thing for her. And at the end, like I said, the ending is like the promise of a relationship to come now that they're both adults. So it's like, in Matsuno's mind, he'd already constructed this love that was like a real thing. But uh, our protagonist, who's uh, who's a bit more mature, kind of realizes that this is more just the beginning. Like it's a base understanding for them to like work to love, maybe. See, this reminds me too that she, uh, when she was really mad at the at, at at Kochi, she said, "Oh, I could never date a boy with a Kochi accent." So, and more of these seeming where it's like kind of more the juxtaposition of city versus country life rather than maturity, or rather, it's a mixture of both since they're all inherently tied up. Yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting that this Kochi city boy is kind of competing over the city girl. Uh, Kochi, not city boys. What's it? A town, like town boys. Country that they're boys. competing over the city girl <laughs> who comes with her baggage and like her troubles and her emotional distress is like the, as I said earlier, depressed pixie girl. <laughs> and they kind of try to integrate her into Kochi. That's uh, while they they are themselves kind of like uh, graduating Kochi because, um, as we know, Muisaki ends up uh, going to college in Tokyo. But I believe Matsuno stays in Kochi, right? Because afterwards, he, his car is the yeah, one that picks does. up Morisaki from the airport, and his car is kind of like his own no, shirt, his own empowerment, he, right? He goes to Kyoto, in Kyoto. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, right. He talks about Kyoto. All right, you're right. Um, but anyway, so I guess I've elaborated plenty on why I find all these things like kind of like thematically and like co- conceptually inappropriate um but i also like like, maybe on a a bit of a lighter note because that's the way i want to present this on a bit of a lighter note it also has a very personal reason for me why i really dislike this movie (laughs) because okay uh hipster mentioned realism earlier and i wanted to really interject uh, and add to that realism because i think it is quite realistic and i agree because i've had experiences similar to this and I'll tell you what, for me, part of maturity was not to like stick to my nostalgic fantasies about this person, which admittedly to some degree still exists because they are really hard to get rid of because you get it stuck into your mind as a teenager and so on. And you really, and for me, like maturing and graduating this consisted in recognizing that this kind of person was just not good for me, that this person I, was something I invented in my mind. And this person was also like, kind of vulnerable and depending and I wasn't helping in any way so 
you know, you sh sometimes just gotta let go of this childish affection shit, you know? <laughs> just say fuck it and move on with your life. And for me, that worked out very well. So seeing this movie go full in and romanticize these weird dynamics just didn't sit right with me. Uh, that's just a very personal note, I suppose. But again, I guess we just disagree in the ending because I, I do yeah. feel like the movie is trying to be hopeful about it, where it's like they're both looking back on the nostalgic like times they had and like how they both felt and like they kind of realized they were being silly and childish, but they can look back on it and like understand now what like both of them wanted and like th they can finally realize their true feelings. So like this is like a whole new chapter because it really feels like um, Ocean Waves seems to me somewhat unique in which a lot of uh, Japanese stuff I've seen about like high school is like really lamenting the last days of high school and why it's like a, such a special time that you need to cherish while this film feels like w way more real in which a lot of the teenagers are like struggling to get to adulthood and they want to leave high school and <laughs> go on to college and be adults as fast as possible like you know real yeah. teenagers are in, in this yeah, in the way the movie, the movie feels like it's always trying to look forward, even if it as it's looking back. Yeah, like like but, you, but, usually but, usually in these like in like the school festival, like, oh, it's always like this hyper romance. Like, oh, it's so sad. Yeah, we yeah, do this thing at the end where she's just like, fuck it, I don't want to like have anything to do with this stupid school festival. I, and she gets like she gets like harassed by the girls because she refuses to do their dance, refuses to work at their um, little cafe thing. She's like, I'm, I'm this is this is this is like this is like a this is an artifact of childhood. I have no interest in. Which is I don't know. It's very it, easy to say. It's very different. It's not than, fitting in with Kochi culture, by the way. <laughs> this, this never forget this. This is also the big part. Yeah, it's true. Definitely um, true. Uh, about this, <laughs> Jesus Christ, my brain leak. Uh, hipster, can you tell me quickly again what what did you just say? Uh, what we we're just talking about, just so I get my train of thought back. Um, about how the movie is trying to look forward. It's about like teenagers oh, yeah. looking forward mm -hmm. into adulthood. So well, I feel like that's quite unique. Interestingly enough, I read a YouTube comment on a video talking about this. I think it was the video uh, by Beyond Ghibli, which I watched about a second look at Ocean Waves. Um, this comment was like, this movie is like the embodiment of the phrase, um, the use is wasted on the young. Because <laughs> yeah, that's very this true. is what I see, like this nostalgic lens is coming from someone who's now going to college, who like kind of, in a sense, I feel like yearns back to those times, despite them being kind of messy, troubled, and confusing, right? Like, as adults, we can probably all look back on youth experiences like that and, that and think, like, in a nostalgic way, like, let's, uh, how would we just redoing this? Like, just going through this again, maybe doing it differently, but whatever. Like, this sense that your youth has rushed away while you are busy maturing, and now you're looking back to it and you're seeing all these weird nostalgic things about it. Right. and. I mean, this feeds into my reading of the ending that he's trying to recapture a bit of this by like acquiring the love object. But okay, sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is kind of what he's doing, but it 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 is trying to be positive. Like, like I assume the people who wrote this, like the the, the original novel and the screenwriter, were like, well, you know, even if you do kind of like uh, get the girl that you were always after in high school, you're two different people now. Like, you're you're mature, and maybe you can make a love from that. Like, it's not impossible. Again, like the movie's trying to be very hopeful, which, yeah, I can guess you can very easily read a toxic relationship into it, but uh, I don't think the movie like presents that as like what will happen in the future. Yeah, because it's like there's all this baggage the movie is trying to deal with the whole time, which we of these two characters and how they, and I, I think the movie's attempting to resolve this baggage so they can go forward. Like, oh, look at all these things. Like, like we, we need to answer all these questions first before we can have a fresh slate and try again, right? I mean, I, it might be trying to do that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like, otherwise the ending wouldn't make sense, right? Uh, but do, does it succeed at doing that? In my opinion, no. I don't know. I'm curious about your guys' opinion. I think Hipster says it does succeed. Yeah, for the most part, I think it succeeds. Um, I, I like the movie. I think it's it's mostly helpful. Like, yeah, you can easily pick out uh, like bad predictions into their future. But uh, in general, I feel like the film language really tries to present this helpful nature. Like I was saying, the the ending where they were on opposite train platforms, uh, a distance you cannot cross, uh, like a, a deadly almost um, gap between them, but then they're on the same platform, and this is like just the beginning. Is it just me? Is this movie like a much more mature and like realistic and um, nuanced, nuanced version of Shinkai? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a lot of Shinkais. Well, Shinkai, I feel like, is way more looking backwards, though, with Lament. Well, again, yeah. I feel like this is a lot more like a, a thoughtful, thoughtful version of that Shinkai I, fantasy. 
I kind of feel yeah. like I would have loved the star-crossed lovers ending a lot more, where there was like never a reconnection between them or something. That would probably have reached shifted my view of the movie substantially. Because I, I, I'm, I'm going to be direct. Like I think on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, this movie feels really good. Like the backgrounds look amazing. The movement, while more limited than the most of the Ghibli films, is great. The music is great. Like I, I love all of this technical aspects uh the aesthetic like uh except like the writing right this is kind of what fucks me like uh, except maybe for the direction very focused on the objectifying lenses uh, in regards to these fantasy constructs of women in this movie but other than this i feel like most of this movie is, is very well well done so yeah i felt the music was really nice really reminds me of the john carpenter's Uh, philosophy that music should yeah. be like wallpaper where it doesn't inform the scene but allows the scene to be like painted onto it and though that's weirdly not true for a lot of john carpenter movies i think <laughs> it definitely really works here and like the the little notes the little synths yeah. like uh, are really cute and like lead again to the very yeah. hopeful atmosphere of it so But I was, yeah. what I was meaning to say, uh, to conclude, like this, this, this take on my uh, how well the movie is made. Um, uh, I read a lot of comments and reviews who were like, "This is kind of boring and dull, and nothing happens, and so on." So I don't know. I, I love this kind of nothing stories in uh, anime uh, animation. You often get like uh, these almost Iyashi K as qualities, where like kind of express this wistfulness and this like. Uh, I, I don't know, like this appreciation of ephemerality in this case through memory is similar to only yesterday. I just very appreciate this kind of pace. Like it's a very unusual way to structure a movie, but it's also very uh I don't know, very special way to me, which makes it even sadder that this movie cannot connect to me. <laughs> I think it's handled better when uh when Miyasaki, for instance, handles like like that scene in Cat Leo's show, uh that's just like really calm. Right before Lupin gets in his car. Yeah, I I, I yeah. really wish Miyazaki directed this movie. I think this movie could have been really amazing <laughs> if he did. <laughs> You're gonna say the same yeah, thing when you get to Wisp of the Heart, right? What? Wisp of the Heart? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you that's know what? You You're gonna say movie. this about every movie. That's true. That's I mean, okay. it's true, but, but, the, but, the, but those two movies, I don't know. Like, it, I'm certain Miyazaki and Takahata had something to do with this movie because it definitely feels that their their marks are on this movie. Like they well, they tr they helped train most of the staff that yeah. made it, and so you know <laughs> yeah. their influence is just too palpable to ignore. But it's like I'd rather have a Miyazaki movie by Miyazaki than a Miyazaki movie by some guy who made Pupa. Pupa. True. <laughs> <laughs> Done. It's true. Shit. But also, this, this doesn't. Shit. Yeah, this doesn't really feel like a Miyazaki movie, anyways. Like it's it's for me, it's like kind of like taking a lot of ideas from only yesterday and taking another narrative like to use these ideas with like uh, at least that's my takeaway from it uh also i feel like it's just always an unfair comparison being compared to the rest of studio ghibli because like oh, if hey, this movie was made in isolation it's it would seem like way better like than most anime movies I would say it's, a, it's a promising start after i mean it's a promising start but a shame that he made poopa afterwards <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, look, that's, that's like, a good point. It's a good the, point. The animation, pro the animation process basically like put them into stress, you know. Like, I, th I think this is pretty easily the worst movie we've 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 um podcasted on so far, and it's from Ghibli, and it's still I think a pretty good, maybe great movie. Yeah, I, I really enjoy this movie. <laughs> like, I recommend it to people, but uh, yeah. it's it's definitely yeah the w weaker than the other ones. It's it's nowhere near as dense or as interesting. He's also directed Amairo Koko, which is a 2015 anime, which has a 4.76 on Mal as an average score. That's also very promising, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, like, I believe he also I, I, directed I, 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 Ranma One Half, if I'm mistaken. Um, a few episodes, sure. I think. Oh, was there only a few episodes? Mm. I didn't see how many. Were. I, I don't think the directing was very special in this, but there was definitely a lot of like the animation and like the backgrounds and like I don't know. This, 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 this movie definitely was carried by its like um like this this the staff definitely knew what they were doing in this movie. Oh, not just a few episodes, sorry. Like it says season one on Mel, which is unclear what it means because a season in a 161 episode show could be like 26 episodes, maybe 13. I just don't assume know. that it's like the opening, I guess. Like, <laughs> opening. Yeah, okay. well, I think we should wrap this up. Right. Yeah, I believe so too. I mean, other than this, I mean, uh, stray thoughts, uh, Porco Rosso shows up in this movie. <laughs> yeah, we get a neat little uh, cameo uh, from him just sitting there eating some ramen. Yeah, Straightforward. Uh, like, 
it yeah. was basically all still camera movements until like the final scene, which you mentioned was an original scene, uh, where he then turn where the camera like turns 180 hmm. and, and shows the girl. Yeah. And he sees her. For me, it's like, Hey, look, this is the prize at the end of the journey. Enjoy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was essentially what like the, it represented. <laughs> It's like, oh, look at this But it was movie. a very well done shot. It's a very well done shot, though. I really liked it. Uh, my last thought would be that uh, I actually ended up taking a lot of notes when watching this um, the last time I watched it because I feel like, uh, yeah, the directing isn't that strong and, like, the animation is all nice, but, like, almost, like, f uh, faultlessly every single scene you can pick out the interplay between adulthood and maturity happening between the characters mm -hmm. like even there's even like a neat little bit uh during the school festival where like the girls are all like gossiping and being all like childish but then like someone comes to order a bowl of noodles from them and they immediately like all perk up into this nice service thing because they're so embarrassed to be gossiping and seen as uh like acting like children and that's like in every scene in the movie like you can watch this over over multiple times and like probably pick out new little interplays along every single scene. So I felt like it was, that was the most in-depth part of it. It's plagued with performed maturity. I, I just really liked how it, what it did with postcards and how it did these like, these little images and turning the past into these, into these images and like very clearly objectifying them, presenting them as such. I don't know. I thought, that, I, thought, I, thought I really thought that was a really beautiful touch. The beautiful touch. All right, then if you don't mind, I will wrap this thing up. And I hope we did justice at least a little bit on our promise to give each movie the coverage and treatment it deserves. As you can, as you've probably heard, I've been a bit rough on this movie. It's just really, you know, uh, I, I, I've tried to like uh, jump in whenever there's the, uh, I could join you guys in pointing out something the movie did well. And I hope I didn't give it an unfair shake. Um, anyways, uh, every listener... Thanks for listening to the Nausicaas. Check out our Discord server, link in the description, if you want to discuss the films or anything else with us. And consider in the future supporting our mic quality by giving us some money on our Patreon at patreon.com slash Nausicaas. This is double A. Uh, all these links are in the description. And uh, I guess we will see you next time when we will be talking about uh, Big Balls. Big Balls coming up next month. But get ready. It's going to be fun. So, goodbye. See ya. Bye. See you. Bye.